see up here is one more partiality. Uh, it's what we're going to be speaking about today. And, uh, it's having a, a liking for, um, which is biased uh, or unfair. And um, partiality is one of these things which we very rarely look at, but it's a, actually quite a big problem for most of us. I mean, just think yourself now. Uh, I, have you looked at the Paralympic Games? Do you like looking at the Paralympic Games? Would you have a prejudice against people who have disabilities? Is there not a slight feeling of uncomfortableness with it? Would you rather look at the able-bodied um, uh, athletes doing their thing? See, there, there's, there's just things in us which uh, maybe in our childhood, I don't know, or things uh, that we grow up with and prejudices that we have, and, uh, and we're partial towards some people, and we're not partial towards others. So it causes a problem, uh, as we can, we can see from what we're going to read now, from 2 Samuel chapter 19. 2 Samuel chapter 19. <coughs> to uh, Solomon, or sorry, Absalom being killed, having rebelled against David and trying, uh, having tried to overthrow David as a king. It says, then it was told Job, behold, the king is weeping and mourns for Absalom. The victory that day was turned to mourning for all the people, for the people of heard it uh, said that day, the king is grieved for his son. So the people went by stealth into the city that day, as the people who are humiliated steal away uh, when, they are, uh, when they flee in battle. The king covered his face and cried out with a loud voice, Oh, my son, Absalom, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Then Job came into the house of the king and said, Today you are covered with shame, the faces of all your servants who today have saved your life and the lives of your sons and daughters, the lives of your wives and the lives of your concubines, by loving those who hate you and by hating those who love you. For you have shown today that princes and servants are nothing to you. For I know this day that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead today, then you would be pleased. Now therefore arise, go out and speak kindly to your servants, for I swear by the Lord, if you do not go out, surely no man will pass the night with you, and this will be worse for you than all the evil that has come upon you from your youth unto now. So the king arose and sat in the gate. When they told all the people, saying, Behold, the king is sitting in the gate, then all the people came before the king. See, the problem here. <laughs> Who was partial to Absalom? David was. David was so tied in with him emotionally that even though this young fella high handedly rebelled against God and God's anointed and sought the kingdom for himself, contrary to God's will, God had promised that Solomon would be the successor to David, and this man knew well. But he wasn't listening to God's word. He was listening to his own ambitions and selfish pride. And he decided he would kill his father if he could and take the throne by force. And yet when he was killed in the battle, which was always likely, then David is broken hearted. He's inconsolable. So much so that when people hear of his weeping, they're going tippy-toe around the place in order not to upset him further. And they feel ashamed like people who have lost the battle rather than people who have won a great victory. And so it's the courage of Joab going in before this man and saying, look, as far as I'm concerned, the princes and all the people and all these, uh, 
all of the army that has put their lives on the line for you, for your wives, for your children, for your kingdom. Uh, and here you're treating them with disdain like they are a problem or they are to blame for what's happened here. You love those who hate you and you hate those who love you. At least your behavior suggests that you do. And then he tells them, get out there and talk to these people and show how grateful you are to them for standing by them. So partiality does come. <laughs> And one of the things about the nature of God is that he shows no partiality. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, and in verse 17, we read, For the Lord your God is the God of gods, and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who does not show partiality, nor take a bribe. Listen to this. God cannot be bought. It said, in worldly terms, every man has his price. And I suppose businessmen more than anybody would know that that's probably true. In the vast majority of cases, every person has their price and can be bought. But God can be bought. Material things mean nothing to him. He created them, they belong to him anyway. So you couldn't bribe him with what belongs to him. But he shows no partiality. The greatest kings and commanders that have ever lived will be treated and judged on exactly the same basis that you will be judged. And we know that paupers, beggars, will be judged with the same equity and righteousness that you will be judged with. It's a wonderful concept. It really is a wonderful concept. In um, Job, chapter 34, which is just before Psalms now, Job 34, <coughs> it is said of God in verse 17, Shall one who hates justice rule, and will you condemn the righteous mighty one, who says to a king, worthless one, to know those wicked ones, who shows no partiality to princes, nor regards the rich above the poor, for they are all the work of his hands, it says. I will give you an idea uh, of uh, God's impartiality. He's the one that can point the finger at the kings and the princes and tell them they're wicked or they're unrighteous. He's the one that can condemn them. He's the one that looks at, I say, the, the pauper and, and uh, also shows no partiality. If he's done wrong, he will receive for the wrong that he has done and that without partiality. He looks at you in exactly the same way. And incidentally, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that he's going to suddenly uh, do for you what he's not prepared to do for other people in the world. I know you're in Christ, but if you think that you can just do what you want as the people of the world think that they can do what they want, he's going to judge you on that basis. So you will be condemned along with them. And make no mistake, God is a judge who sees through us. He knows all our thoughts, all our words, all our deeds. You've hidden nothing from him. And if you're living the life of a hypocrite, or if you are, are giving yourself over to the world, he knows it right well. And you won't fool him. You just won't fool him. But it's a wonderful characteristic of God that he's without partiality. It's not something for us to fear. It is something for us to welcome. Uh, in Acts chapter 10, when Peter was called to the household of Cornelius, 
a Gentile. <clears throat> it suddenly dawned on him that God is not partial. He says in verse 34, opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Listen to that. In every nation, whether it's in, in the Jewish nation or in the Gentile nations, in Ireland, in China, in Czechoslovakia, wherever, in Africa, it makes no difference to God. Everyone who wants to do what is right is welcome to God, and God will receive you with open arms through Jesus Christ our Lord. Whatever prejudice we might have in our heads about people who live in different countries or who are not of the same nationality as ourselves, we do not share with God his impartiality. We are partial in ourselves, and that partiality can cause great offence and trouble between nations. So we ought not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. We ought to understand where we stand in God's sight, and that is that we will be judged according to our deeds. We will be judged with righteousness, uprightness, fairness, and justice. And so we have got to be able to see ourselves as God sees us. Because if we can't do it now, we are going to get a shock on the day of judgment. We are absolutely going to be taken back that God sees us in this way and we have never seen ourselves in this way. We have never been detached enough to be able to look at ourselves and see ourselves as God sees us. Very important for us to be able to do that. We're emotionally tied up with ourselves. The love aspect of self is, is strong in most individuals. And it shows in, in very many ways. So we, because we're so tied up with ourselves, we're making excuses for ourselves all over the place. We've got a hundred and one, if not a thousand and one excuses for every wrong thing that we do in life. And all sorts of justification ranging from what happened to us when we were children to the unfairness of the treatment that people are meeting out to you in the present day. God, it says in Romans chapter 2 verse 11, is unlike us in this, that he shows no partiality. It's a simple statement here in chapter 2, verse 11. And it says, for there is no partiality with God. And that's after he had said about those who do good and they will receive immortality and eternal life, and those who did evil will suffer wrath and indignation. And uh, it's, that uh, would be whether Jew or Gentile, or Jew or Greek, and, uh, and God is going to see to it that it's fairly spread out among us in that way. So God is, is not one to show partiality. And we need to see that, we need to understand that, we need to accept that, and we need to try to be like God. Even Jesus, even Jesus was commended because of his impartiality by his enemies. In Matthew chapter 22, and in verse 16, after hatching a plot against Jesus, the Pharisees sent their disciples. Of course, they don't want to do their dirty work themselves, so they sent their disciples. And it says in verse 16, they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any. Just, uh, that just really moves me. That Christ the Lord would teach uh, the, way of, the way of God so impartially. Everybody was 
told what God thought about them, what their situation was, what they need to do, and they did it without fear. Uh, not that there shouldn't have been any fear, there should have been because he's put his life on the line so many times. But he went ahead and he taught impartially. And even these servants of the Pharisees who were so used to licking the feet or kissing the feet of those they served, they couldn't, uh, they, they had to commend him because they realized he was as much, he was as straightforward with the Pharisees and, and his determination was to show what was right in their, or wrong in their behavior by showing what was right in God's eyes that they just commended him. And I'm sure they stood in awe of him for that reason. He was to be feared. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8 and 9, it talks about the Lord. And it says this. But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. Now, righteousness is when you do right according to the standard which God has set up for us in his word or in his law, and it is a law which is consistent with his own righteous nature. So we're dealing in the right way with each other, whether we're, it's Christian on Christian, it's... Uh, uh, family on family, neighbors on neighbors, uh, workmates on workmates, um, civilians on government or whatever else, we're treating each other with the respect uh, that each other deserves, with the love that each other deserves, with the, with the, with the thought of the well-being and the good of each other before our own well-being and good. That's the way we have to work it in order to be doing it God's way. That's the way God works it. I think the devil always wants to uh, impugn the character of God. But these teachings on righteousness and uprightness and fairness and justice guarantee us that God will always treat you right. <laughs> we know what it's like to be sucked in by uh, people who would promise you the earth and then once they have control over you, treat you abominably for their own ends. There's too many examples of it in life. I just need to say it, you know what I'm talking about. But our God will never <coughs> ever do that to us. He couldn't, he, he could no more do that to us than lie to us, which it would have been a lie anyway. God cannot lie. God always speaks the truth. God always do, does what is right. For every one he has created, he, is, he will always do what is right. He has always done what is right. And on the judgment day, you're going to see how right he was and how good he was towards you. So here's this righteousness, and it's a scepter of righteousness by which Christ rules. In verse 9 he says, You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness, therefore God your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions, he says. Just in keeping with that, look at Psalm 119. We'll finish this point on Psalm 119. are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. You have commanded your testimonies in righteousness and exceeding faithfulness. Now he had come to terms, he had got a grip on the idea that God in his own very nature is righteous and will always do right and we can count on him doing right. And even the commandments that he has given under the old law were righteous. And David loved them because they were right. 
it, the keeping the commandment sets a level playing field for everybody. That's why we mustn't kick against law. I know it's in our nature as Irish people to, to hate to be uh, restricted in any way, to, to kick against the laws or to rationalise them, to, to show how stupid they are and why I shouldn't keep those laws. Law is a level, making a level playing field for everyone and it will take away the selfishness. It's not always good for us, but it's always better for the majority if it's not good for necessarily for the individual. So we mustn't have this attitude of always resenting uh, having laws that control us. They're just absolutely necessary. And especially God's laws, because we can see in them how blessed we are in keeping those laws and how blessed everybody else is that we keep these laws. They're righteous altogether. Verse 142, your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and your law is truth. God is dealing with the reality, not some make-believe um, world that the, like the devil lives in and all of the evil people live in. This is dealing with life as it really is and coping with it as it really is. And his righteousness is everlasting. It will never end. It's as everlasting as he is himself. Your testimonies, he says in 144, are righteous forever. Give me understanding that I may live. And verse 60, the sum of your word is truth. Every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. And the last one, 172, let my tongue sing of your word, for all your commandments are righteous. So the scepter of righteousness is right in accordance with God's commandments, which is in accordance with God's righteous character. Do you think you have enough objectivity as a human, as a, as a person, as a Christian, to be able to view yourself and life and others with, with that view that God has of us, or that view of life that God gives it, uh, uh, of it in the scriptures. Do you think you have the ability? If you don't, you need to start thinking from now on, I need to get a grip here, I need to start seeing things differently, and I need to understand that it's only as I see it as God sees it, as his word proclaims it, that I'm seeing it in reality. And sometimes the shock is, oh, but where does that leave me? Where does that leave me? As we've seen from our introduction, the, part, the, the, uh, the hardest part in not showing partiality is when it comes to our family. When it comes to our children, our brothers and sisters, our mothers and fathers, and maybe, to some, to some extent, the extended family, we're so totally partial towards them. We're so tied up emotionally with them. And this is especially so with mothers. Mothers conceive the child. And they carry the child for the nine months. Mothers are uh, give birth to the child and suffer all that pain to give birth to the child. Then they nurture the child and train them and teach them and look after their every need and stay up late at night and wake up every time the child wakes up to feed them or to look after them or whatever. They've got great responsibility. But this creates a bond of love and of affection which is which is almost hope. But what happens is that it creates problems. It creates problems because when the young person grows up, 
And even in the case where, uh, say it's a young, young boy, and he meets a girl and he wants to get married to her, and the Bible says, he leaves his father and his mother, and is joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Indicating that that connection with the first family, the mother and the father, is now pretty well broken. A new unit has come into existence, which has a life of its own. And the, the, the young people need to be given the chance to live their own life. And parents must respect them enough to say, you can live your own life. I've taught you what is right, I've taught you what is good, but now it's up to you to make the choices yourself. And because some, some others can't let go, they still want the son tied to the apron strings. And the mother in the, all the love circumstances becomes the proverbial mother-in-law. And what a nightmare that is, the proverbial mother-in-law, who's involved in everything that's happening in the son's life and in the daughter-in-law's life, who is manipulating the situation and who is controlling the son. Inevitably, there's going to be problems. The son is torn between his mother and his wife, which he shouldn't be. It should be, my wife is my wife. And I'm very grateful to my mother and I love my mother. But she is not in charge of me anymore. And uh, my wife's in charge of me now. <laughs> it's not supposed to be that way either. So that's another story and that's another lesson at some stage. Right now, what I'm trying to get to you is, listen, I think there has to be a, a, a lesson here for all of us. Do you know that your children are a gift from God? Look at Psalm 127. It says in verse 3, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord, the fruit of the womb is a reward. But if God has given them to us as a gift, who did they belong to in the first place? about that. And while you're thinking about it, then turn to Genesis chapter 33 verse 5. <coughs> then Esau ran to meet him, ran to meet Jacob, and embraced him, and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Verse 5. He lifted his eyes and saw the women and the children and said, Who are these with you? So he said, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. Genesis chapter 33, verse 5. Then. The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Listen to this now. Because this is very important. Your children belong to God. Primarily. He has given them into your care. And he has entrusted you with the stewardship of parenthood. He expects you to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. He expects you when they're raised to give them their freedom to live their own lives and to make their own choices. Of course you'll always love them. People say, my love is unconditional towards my family. And you need to make allowance for them. 
and we want to make allowance for them. But everybody else is to blame for whatever is happening. My children are not to blame for any of this. They never do anything wrong. But that's just sheer nonsense. It shows that you're completely wrapped up with your children to the extent that you have forgotten that they are gods and that they are entrusted to you and that you have to have a certain amount of objectivity in order to be able to make a judgment of what your children are doing. David lost it with Absalom. Absalom set himself on an evil, murderous course. Many lives were lost because of this man's ambition. He was evil. He was a good looking man. He was intelligent. The people loved him. He persuaded them that he would look after them better than his own father would. He had all the personality, all the drive, everything that was needed to be a leader in this life. But he was an evil man. He was selfishly ambitious and selfishly indulgent. He wanted for himself and not for God and not for the well-being of the people. David had more regard for him and tried to make excuse for what he's doing than he did for his own people who were defending his life and saving his kingdom. Was that right? How are we going to see our children the way God sees them? Because otherwise, I've been, it's been said, I don't know that I could be happy in heaven if my children are lost, or if my family is lost, which includes more than my children. You see, we're not seeing things as they really are. If they have made a choice to go against God's word, that means they made the choice to go against God. That means they have involved themselves, they've, de they've denied the truth and the righteousness of God's ways, and they have involved themselves in selfish pursuits and the evil way, the way of the world, the traditions and customs of the country that they live in. They have gone along with it and they've got the approval of others. Can God accept that? <clears throat> I've heard my neighbors say, when my husband was alive, he didn't believe in God, but he was a good man. And I know he was. He was concerned about the neighbors, he was a good husband, he was a hard worker, and he just, he did everything right. It's people like him that uh, cause problems for us. And the man next door just died, she said, well, he's up there with my husband. What could I say? I can't say anything at that stage. We're told in Hebrews that unless we believe that God <coughs> is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, we cannot please God. So what does that mean if you die in that state? If you weren't pleasing to him here, but suddenly because you die, you're pleasing to him in the hereafter. But you see, you can't, they won't go there. They won't accept that. That's just, no, but there's too much emotion involved here, too much illogical uh, thinking involved. It is not God's thinking. It is my thinking. But on the day of judgment, I'm going to be forced to accept it. Because it was the truth all along. You see what I'm saying? Somehow or other, along the line, we have to every now and then pull back from our family and start to look at them and to see them as God sees them. And as much as you love them, and as much as it might break your heart, we have to accept the reality. We have to accept the reality and deal with it. There was a, a, um, a thing in Deuteronomy 13, I want you to look here. 
Two, two examples, uh, and I'll finish this point. from your family to see them as God sees them and to realize that if they continue in the way they're going, they will be lost. <coughs> it hasn't happened. Fortunately, God doesn't make any of these demands on us. But he does want us to stand for the truth. And he does want us to not be influenced by their lives, their lives of, of sinfulness and our wrongdoing. <laughs> and he does not want us to be approving of it or supporting it. If we go to the judges to see when they were appointed or the leaders in Deuteronomy, you're in Deuteronomy, look in Deuteronomy chapter 1 now. This is moving on in this lesson. Thank 
19, go back to 19.
who are not gods, whose breath of life is in their mouth or in their lungs, who will die and become dust and can do nothing against us or for us at that stage. Why are we so impressed with them? Why are we so pleasing them instead of the Lord? We mustn't look to the good and be partial to them over the wicked. And we mustn't look to the wicked or the poor for that matter and be partial to them over the rich or those who are doing what is right. We must judge all men fairly. And we must have that attachment. I'm going to finish up by saying, when we go back to David, David was deeply partial to his son, to the heart of the nation. But when he was told off by Job, when Job explained the reality of the situation and David saw it, the one thing you've got to give this man credit for is when he saw it, he changed his behavior immediately and did what was right. The challenge for you today is if you see what I'm trying to get through to you, if you see it as the Lord telling you something, don't go out of here and just do what you've always done. From this day forward, change your ways so that it might be in keeping with the impartiality of God. And do that to the glory of the truth and the benefit of your fellow man and yourself. God is the <laughs>